The title of this, What Does Testament Mean? Today's Bible, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. You ask someone, well, what's, what, does, what does the word testament mean? And most of the time, they can't answer you. But the word testament means it, a covenant. We have a covenant with the Lord. We have an agreement with Him. It's kind of like a contract with Him. If you agree with the words of God and believe them, you can make a covenant with Him. But you have to believe Him. And you have to believe His words. You have to do this. You have to be a believer to go into covenant with the Lord. God made an agreement with Adam. God promised him since he was sinless that he would give him everlasting life. That's what he told Adam. On the conditions that he would have perfect obedience to him. Obey God in everything. His obedience would be to follow his, his command on not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But because of the devil, he failed to that command from the Lord. Adam broke his covenant. And because of that, the Lord put a curse on him. And God said, In the day that ye eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what he told Adam. So we, be we became dead to God spiritually. Because we know he didn't die physically because he populated the earth. But he did die spiritually. He was separated. That's what death, death means. You're separated from God. We're not talking about a physical death. We're talking about a spiritual death. In Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead, so we were because of Adam and Eve, we're everyone who is born now, are were dead. Now let me let me say this. Now when you're born as a baby, until you get to the age of accountability, which there is no certain number, but when a child gets to the age of accountability, where he knows what living for for the Lord is and what isn't living for the Lord, up until then he's not accountable. So all all little kids, babies. When they die, they go to heaven because they're innocent. But the Lord has, has a time, like I said, it's not an age, but when a child, because you've got ch children who are smarter than others, some were not as smart, and it takes them maybe a little longer. But when they get to that accountability, then they have to choose, and we'll see that more into the teaching. This agreement or contract with the Lord is not one that you sign on a piece of paper. It's much more than that. This agreement is with blood. So we're going to see that this covenant is a blood covenant. Covenant means the two become one. The blood covenant means two become one by the shedding of blood. When we get married with the Lord, we become His bride. We accept Him as Lord. Jesus had to shed His blood for this to happen, and He did it on the cross. Jesus had to give blood once. It says in Hebrews 10.10, 10, for God's will was for us to be made holy by sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So he only had to give his blood one time. Not like the animal sacrifices they have in the Old Testament where they had to do it over and over and over again. Jesus was the final blood sacrifice. Men and women have the same blood covenant when they perform intercourse. A woman bleeds on the first time and the only time. This is a blood covenant between man and woman. And this, this hymen, it's called a hymen that they have. Medical doctors, they'll tell you, they don't, know why, they don't know why women have this. Well, God put that there. Because in, in God's eyes, marriage begins at intercourse. So when a woman bleeds, that's a blood covenant between her and her husband. Just like we have a blood covenant with the Lord. That's why he hates divorce. Because it's a blood covenant. When you break it, it's bad. And I'll get more on that also. For the Lord and for us, when we learn, once we go through this teaching here, for the Lord, covenant is a very serious matter. Very serious matter. Most of us take it lightly. Giving our life to the Lord, most of us don't even know what we're doing. We don't know we're going into a covenant with the Lord, a blood covenant. And they don't explain that too much in church. But I'm going to teach you in the words of God, that we go into blood covenant with the Lord. Because He shed His blood for us to be saved. So we go into a, a covenant with Him. A blood covenant with Him. And we're going to learn through this teaching. What is a blood covenant? Israel committed spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. By worshiping other gods. And He divorced Israel. 
Now, this is another teaching, but in a marriage, the Lord says the only grounds for divorce is adultery. Well, it's not just physical adultery. Just like Israel committed spiritual adultery here, that's the same thing in the marriage today. If a man or whatever spouse wants to go and worship other gods, that, that spouse is committing spiritual adultery. And we'll learn that with uh, how Israel did that. In Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through 9, During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what fickle Israel has done? Like a wife who commits adultery, Israel has worshipped other gods on every hill and under every green tree. And though after she has done all this, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her faithless sister Judah saw this. She saw that I divorced faithless Israel because of her adultery. But that treacherous sister Judah had no fear. And now she too has left me and given herself to prostitution. So I'm showing right here where Israel and Judah. First Israel, the nation of Israel did it. And then Judah right here, the nation of Judah followed right with Israel. So the God, God does... the. Grounds for divorce is not only a physical adultery, but it's also a spiritual adultery. In marriage, a man and a woman vow to live together for lifelong commitment. In Genesis 2.24 Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they, and they shall be one flesh. Again in Matthew 19, 5 through 6 And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. This is a command from the Lord. Once you get married, this is for, for the Lord, this is a lifelong commitment. And because He has put it together, if you seek the Lord, if you're a Christian when you're single, and you're seeking the Lord for your, your spouse, then he will show. He will bring you a spouse. And right here he says, whatever he has joined together, let no man put asunder. In God's eyes, this is a blood covenant. That's why he says he hates divorce. In Malachi 2, 15 through 16, Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife, in body and spirit? You are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to your wife, of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. So guard your heart, do not be unfaithful to your wife. So the Lord hates it when Christians, one or the other, is unfaithful. Right here, he says he he hates divorce, and usually, if you're unfaithful, usually it, it ends up in a divorce. In Mark. 10.9, let no one split apart what God has joined together. It says it again. Another reason is because he wants godly children to come from the marriage. Because that's what he said up here. From a, from a marriage, being one with your wife, husband, he says, I will get godly children from this. And this is another reason he hates divorce. Because if the, if the husband and wife divorce, there's very small chance that, that the kids are going to come out Christians. They have a much better chance of being Christians if the husband and wife stay together and, and are living a Christian life. Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is a promise from God. How many, take, how many of us take the promises of God to heart? I mean, when He promises something, how many of us believe it? Well, if you believe this, especially Brandon and Lindsay, y'all young, when you have kids, you train that child in the way he should go. And when he gets old, he will not depart from it. God said it right here. He will not depart from it. So if you want your kids to be godly kids, Christians, train them. Train them when they're small, from baby on up. And if you do that, you will have Christian kids. Amen? Amen. This is a promise. We're going to see how serious it is when you say, I give my life to you. When you say, I give my life to you. We're going to see how serious. Do we really know what we're doing? In marriage or even to the Lord. In marriage, which we're going to get a lot more on marriage, but 
even with the Lord, do we know what we're saying when we, when we say, I give my life to you, to God, to the Lord? This is, another, this is what this teaching is going to be on. When we go into a blood covenant, we give ourselves totally, totally to the one we go into covenant with. Husband and wife, when you go into covenant, when you get married, you make vows. And it's, it's like a covenant. You, you make an agreement that this is what you're going to do. And the Lord takes that very seriously. And He says, we are supposed to give to each other totally. Which we're going to learn that in the blood covenant. Part of being in the blood covenant, or just a covenant, is you give yourself to the other person totally. We're giving everything we have, our very lives, to Him and Him to us. Just like we go in the covenant with the Lord, He, he is giving us Him by living in us. And then in return, we give Him everything of us. We live totally for Him. These are, just, these are things I'm going to get into. I'm just kind of pointing them out right now. So we better know what we're doing when, when we enter into a blood covenant, especially with the Lord. First, I'd like to show you what the blood covenant is between men. There's a blood covenant between men in the Bible. The way the Hebrew men did it, first they would take off their robe and give it to each other. The robe represented who you were back in them days. They would put on their robe and, and just like it says in Romans 13, 14, we as Christians, when we go in covenant with the Lord, it says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Men put on each other's robe. In the spiritual life that we live in, this is the way we do it. We, we're going into covenant with the Lord, so we put Jesus on. We put Him on. Totally dependent on one another. We're totally dependent on Him. Now for men, they depended on each other. Okay? The Lord doesn't depend on us. Okay? All we, all we do is live for Him and obey Him. Right? But for men, they depended on each other. Second thing, they would take off their belt, which had weapons on it. A sword, a sling. That was shown, here's my strength. I'm giving you my strength by taking off the belt. Thirdly, was the cutting and the blood. They would take an animal and split it right down the middle. Right down the skull, down the backbone, they'd split it right down the middle. And they would stand in the middle of this animal. After they split it open, they would stand in the middle of the animal. In the blood, they'd be standing in the blood, representing death to themselves. De the, the word blood in the Bible represents death, but it also represents life. Me, I'm dying to self because I'm giving me to you and him to me. This is what this is saying. In Hebrews 9, verse 18 and verse 22, that is why even the first covenant, which we're talking about right now, because we're going to find out there's two covenants, the first one and the second one. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of animals. And in verse 22, in fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood for without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness so if we don't take on the blood of Jesus when he died on the cross we get no forgiveness for our sins we have to have Jesus in order to have forgiveness of sin then they would face each other and begin to walk they would begin to walk like a figure eight now this is this is a figure eight is a symbol of infinity you know this is forever this is not for the wall it's just like marriage. Marriage is forever. In fact, you take two rings, the wedding rings, and put them side by side, you get a figure eight. So the Lord did the same thing here. And that's where the rings come from, to show we're in this forever. You see how far we are from getting away from the Lord. Marriage is, coming, marriage is going to become a thing of the past pretty soon, because people are just living together. Then they would meet in the middle and raise their right hands while they're standing in the middle of the blood. They would nick the palm of their hands and they would join them together and then they would get a rope and make again make a figure eight tying them together. Again, showing the never ending covenant. Then they would point to the animal. Both of them would point to the animal and they would say, God do to me and more if I break this covenant. So you see how serious God takes covenants. When you make a covenant with the Lord, He's very serious about it. This is not something we play around with and say, oh yeah, 
I give my life to the Lord. Well, it's, it's not simple like that. You got to know what you're doing. And then they would have people standing. People would be there. People would be standing around witnessing this. And not only people would be there, but a priest would be there. And the priest would go to them and pronounce, pronounce blessings to them and curses. So it, the priest would say, these are the blessings you will have by having this covenant, living together, you know, not, not men and men, but, you know, being one, because those two men became one. So he gives them blessing, but if they break the covenant, then he pronounces curses on them. But this is what's going to happen if you break this covenant. So I tell you, this is like a wedding, like a wedding. There's nothing, can, nothing good can come out of a divorce. Divorce, all it does is, is destroys the marriage you have and it usually destroys the children. And just, just like he did with Adam, what did he do with Adam? Adam was king of the, over the earth, king. But because he disobeyed God, he became a servant. So there's curses when you don't obey God. There's curses. Then they would start telling each other what they owned. Give it to each other. And that's the way a marriage is. You come into a marriage, husband and wife, whatever she has is yours, whatever he has is hers. Y'all are one. Just remember, this is a big word. You become one. But that's the way it's supposed to be in a marriage also. What, what, what belongs to her and what belongs to him, now they're one. It belongs to both of y'all. If you owe someone like a bank or a credit, well, your spouse owns, owns it also. If you get rich, then your spouse is rich also. Y'all are one. No, you don't, you don't, your marriage is not two, it's one. And this is the same thing with the Lord spiritually. We're one with God. If we, if we obey His commands, we're one with Him. Now, if we start going off on our own thing and not obeying God, curses come in. So it's a good thing to, to, uh, to obey God. Amen. And like I said, and if you owe, the Lord says He doesn't want us to owe anyone. In fact, Romans 13, 8, He says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. God doesn't want us to be in debt to anyone. So, young people in here, if you can do that, not if you can do it, if you're doing it the Lord's way, if you're walking with God, you can go and not be in debt. Because the Lord, what did the Lord say? I will supply everything you need. Everything you need, He will supply. How many of us believe that? He will supply. And He'll supply our wants sometimes. If you're walking with the Lord, you don't need to worry about owing anybody because God's going to take care of us. He said He will. Then they would change their name, just like marriage. They would change their name to show that they were really becoming one. Which many times in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God would change the names. <clears throat> like Abram to Abraham. They went into covenant and God changed His name from Abram to Abraham. Same thing with Sarah. He changed from Sarai to Sarah. Paul. Paul's name was Saul. Saul gave his life to the Lord. And God said, your name is Paul now. So they changed their name and when they become one. And this is why the wife takes the name of the husband. Why? Because the Lord has made him the head of the house. And don't get confused. I didn't say he made him the boss of the house. Made him the head. Head means... You supply the needs of your wife and your children. And the main thing, you supply, you feed them spiritually. It's up to the man that the wife and the kids learn who the Lord is. It's up to the husband. That's, that is him as being the head of the house. Many men take that the wrong way, like I'm the boss. Then it doesn't say boss. It says head. You got responsibilities. And the biggest responsibility is showing your wife and your kids the Word of God. Just like Jody and I, when... We left the church where we were at, and I prayed to the Lord to show me what church to go to. I didn't feel Him leaving me anywhere. But it was my responsibility to make sure she was get, still getting fed. And this is how my ministry started. I was feeding her every Sunday morning. We'd have to church, just me and her, because that was my responsibility. And then this ministry got started from that. But I'm just showing the man's responsibility is to take care of the house, feed the family the Word of God. So men, our, our husbands, our guys who are going to be husbands, 
That's a command from the Lord that we do. And then after they did that, if they changed their names, they would put mud or something like mud on the score of their hand. And that was just to show that they belonged to one another. He had a score and he had a score. And people would see these two friends, when they had scores, they would know that they were blood covenant brothers. All right? The score. It was like a seal of the, the covenant. The, the score on their hands. If someone messes with... If I'm in blood covenant with another guy, if someone messes with me, they're messing with two of us. Same thing in our Christian walk with the Lord. If you belong to God, if you're in the blood covenant with the Lord, if someone messes with you, they're messing with God. Our scar that we have in our blood covenant with the Lord, our scar is the light that shines in us. When people see the light of Jesus shining in you, they know who you belong to. Amen? Amen. So Christians, if your light is not shining... You're not walking in the blood covenant with the Lord. I'm not saying you're lost, but you're not showing the scar that you belong to Jesus. Hope you understand what I said there. And then they would build a memorial. These are, like I said, this is a covenant between men and men. Then they would build a memorial to show of their covenant. Just like it it happened many times in the Bible. In Genesis 9, verses 12 through 15, the sign of God's covenant with Noah, because God made a covenant with Noah, the sign was the rainbow. He said he would never let he would never flood the earth again. And he used the rainbow as a sign. In Genesis seventeen, verses ten through fourteen, the sign the sign between God and Abraham and Moses was circumcision. That's why Jews always circumcised. That was that was a sign that the Lord had made a covenant with with Moses and, and uh, Abraham. In Genesis 21, verses 32 and 33, Abraham went into covenant with Abimelech, and they plant a tree for a memorial. When they went into covenant, they planted a tree. In Genesis 31, verses 46 through 48, Jacob and Laban, his uncle, went into a covenant, and they piled up some stones as a memorial. This is all through the Bible. When someone goes into a covenant, they would, they would, they would have a memorial somewhere shown that they're in, they have gone into covenant with this person. They would also give each other's gifts. Now, the Bible really doesn't say what, what they gave, but it just says they would give them, they would exchange gifts. Then the next step would be they would have a memorial meal. Now, this is, pay attention to this, because we do this today, Christians. They would have a memorial meal. They would say to each other, you have, just like, you have my robe, you have my weapon, you have my belt. Our blood has flowed together. We've changed names, but now we want to be more intimate. That's the way we should be with the Lord. We want to get closer to the Lord, as close as we can to the Lord. This memorial meal is why we have the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper today, to remind us of our covenant with the Lord. That's, there's a covenant meal, and that's why we have the Lord's Supper. John six forty eight through fifty one. The Lord says, "I am the I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead." Now, what this is saying is, back in uh, when they when when the Lord took them out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness for forty years, your fathers did eat manna, which was food, but they died because they were they were living off food, physical food. And the Lord says, and they died. And then he says in verse 50, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. So now we're talking about the word of God. Now we're talking about the Lord. He's our bread. He's our bread of life. 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Thousands of people, thousands of people, Jesus fed. It wasn't the bread that were one. When the Lord fed the thousands, people were there eating the bread, the fish. But also at the same time, Jesus was, was preaching to them. But they didn't want that. In John 6, verse 26 and 27, it says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Talking about talking to the thousands. He said, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, 
but because you did eat of loaves and were filled. This is why I tell people who are looking for a sign so they can believe. Right here, Jesus performed, took a couple of fish and fed thousands. But they didn't come. They didn't, they didn't accept Jesus as Savior. They were with them because God was feeding them. That's it. So, signs, people who say, I, I want to see a sign, that's not going to do nothing. The Bible says they're drawn by the Holy Spirit, by the Father. That's the way you're drawn to the Lord. Not by signs, not, not by miracles. They were following Jesus, like I said, because they were, He was feeding them of physical food. In verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perish, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So who gives us spiritual food? Jesus. The Son, Jesus. He's the one that feeds us the spiritual food. That's the bread we need. That's the bread that will give us eternal life. Now back to the covenant between men. These men would take the bread and say to each other, they're having a covenant meal, and they would say to, to each other, they would say, eat, this is my body. Meaning, take me into you, you into me, just like it says in John. Jesus said the same thing. These men are supposed to say this to each other? Well, Jesus said the same thing to us in John 14, 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Now, we can't get any closer to the Lord than that. He's in us, and we're in Him. And together we're in the Father. So then they would take some wine and drink. This is my life's blood. And saying that, they were saying what it says in Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. They were not really drinking blood. What they were drinking was to, what they were drinking was to represent blood. The life comes from the Spirit, which we read in John 6:63. 6, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, which means make alive. The Spirit makes you alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. We, we can't do nothing without the, flesh, without the Spirit. In fact, the Lord says, it doesn't matter how good you are. You're nothing without Him. He says our righteousness, our righteousness, not God's righteousness. He says our, your righteousness are as filthy rags to me. That's what God is saying to us. Your righteousness, your goodness is as filthy rags to me. This is what God said. So you have to have the Spirit. And it says, The words that I, that I, this is Jesus, the words that I speak unto you, they are a Spirit and they are life. So how do you get life? Through the Spirit. And who is the Spirit? The Holy Spirit? Jesus. So there's where life comes from. Life is in the blood, but is in the blood that was shed at the cross. Now you know what you're doing when you take the Lord's Supper. This is the last step to the covenant. And that's why He lets us know how important it is. This, this Lord's Supper, He lets us know how important it is. This, is. this is a covenant meal. It's just not a meal. It's a covenant meal. Remember that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. It says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body and the blood and blood of the Lord. Taking it unworthy is is taking it as just a ritual. That's one way of just taking it unworthy. You're just doing it as a ritual. It's not a ritual. It doesn't come from the heart that way. Some might take it and have sin in their life they haven't repented of. That's taking the Lord's Supper unworthy. When you have sin and you, and, and, it ha and you haven't repented of it. If you have a brother or a sister out there or anybody out there and there's something between y'all, you need, you need to not take this supper, not take this meal, and go and make it right. And if the person that you have a problem with, if they don't want to make it right, that's their problem. But you need to try to make it right before you take the Lord's Supper. You cannot have sin in your life. When you, how many of us know when you ask for forgiveness, the Lord forgives you right then and there. And you are sinless until you sin again. And we're going to continue sin. None of us are perfect. But from, that, from the time you ask for forgiveness of that sin, you are sinless until you sin again. Now, some Christians think, well, you know, we sin every day. Well, you don't have to. 
you can go days without sinning. And depending on how close you are with the Lord, you can go weeks without sinning. You will sin again, but this thing, uh, oh, we sin every day? No. If you're not walking with the Lord, then you sin every day. If you take it for any other reason but to, to, but to praise and worship God, if you take the Lord's Supper for any other reason except for the praise and worship Him, to love Him as Lord, it is unworthy. There is, I hope you all hear me. A lot of people take the Lord's Supper and they're not doing it right. The Bible says it right here. I'm reading it to you. You're sinning against the Lord. When you take the Lord's Supper unworthily, you're sinning against God. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. So before you take the supper, we are to examine ourselves. Do a deep examine of yourself before you take the supper. And if there's anything you need to repent of, repent of it. This is what it's saying right here. Examine yourself. Check yourself out before you take the Lord's Supper. you got to make sure that you're pure. And we're pure. Like I said, as soon as we ask for forgiveness of sin, we're pure until we sin again. We cannot have unforgiven sin on our lives and take the Lord's Supper. Verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh dam damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. If you're not judging yourself right, you're bringing judgment on yourself. When you take that Lord's Supper and you're saying, Oh, I'm okay. I, you know, if you're not examining yourself right, you're bringing judgment on yourself. And this is why it says in the next verse, this next verse is very important. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. You take the Lord's Supper unworthy. This is what the Lord says right here. You can become weak sickly and even die this is the verses you this is the scriptures you got them in your hand take it home look up the scriptures and read it for yourself out of your own bible and see if it doesn't say that god doesn't eternally condemn you if you're a born again christian he doesn't he doesn't kick you out of heaven you still have salvation but it, you could receive a serious illness out of it this was this is what this verse is saying and not only that, you could even die. But it's not a spiritual death, like I said. Now, how many of us knew that? How many of us knew if we took the Lord's Supper unworthy, that we could bring sickness on ourselves and even die? They don't teach this in the, in the church. Is this the Word of God? Mm -hmm. Am I giving you the Word of God? Yes. I'm not taking that out of context. I'm just reading verse by verse the Word of God. Churches need to, they need, pastors need to tell the people, hey, if you're not right, if you're not walking with the Lord, do not, do not take the Lord's Supper. But they don't do that. They just let everybody take it. Well, I'm showing you here how serious it is, it is with the Lord, the Lord's Supper. Amen? Amen. The Lord's Supper is a very spiritual. It's very spiritual. It's just not eating uh, crumbs of bread and drinking some grape juice. That's not, that's not all it is. Now, for the Catholics... The Catholics believe that that is the real blood turns into blood. Now, if they want to believe that, that's fine. I don't have anything against that. It doesn't, but if that's what they want to believe, that's fine. It's, it's the purpose why you're taking it. Because you're in blood covenant with the Lord, and, he, and this is your meal to show you're with Him. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1-4, through 4, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry land. Let me just say something about that right now. They went through the Red Sea when they left Egypt, how the Lord split the sea. It says it was dry. When God does something, He does it perfect. It wasn't muddy. I mean, there was water. There was a, a sea there. You would think the water, the, it would have mud. But right here, the Lord said it was dry. When God does something, this is the way He does it. He does it right. I just wanted to point that out. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them 
And that rock was Christ. Who's Christ? Jesus. So is Jesus only in the New Testament? No, Jesus is in the Old Testament. Because right here it says Christ. Jesus Christ walked with them back when they were in the wilderness. So we need the Old Testament. People who believe that we don't need the Old Testament, they have no truth whatsoever of God. Because there's no way you can believe the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. He blessed them because they ate and drank of spiritual food, which is Jesus. Now, you have to be walking in the Spirit to receive this food. You have to be walking with the Lord to receive the spiritual food. Because if you're not walking with Him, how are you going to receive stuff that's spiritual when you're not spiritual yourself? Yeah. You have to be walking with the Lord to receive this spiritual food. This is what true born-again Christians want. This is what a true born-again Christian wants. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Who is righteousness? Jesus. We need to be hungry and thirsty for Him. That's what walking in the Spirit is. Hungry for Him. Like y'all here tonight at this Bible study, apparently y'all must be hungry to hear the Word of God, right? Or y'all wouldn't be here. But God said, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst. God's going to bless you for being hungry and thirsty. And how's He going to bless you? He's going to give you spiritual food. Amen? Amen? We want to be filled with the true bread. The Word. This is the only way we can get the true satisfaction is by being in God's words. Jody over there, love her to death. She's my wife. The Lord blessed me tremendously with her. But I don't depend on her to bring me happiness. She does but my t I depend on the Lord because He will never fail me. And just like I fail her sometimes, she'll fail me sometimes. But God will never fail you. That if you want true happiness, the Lord gives it. The Lord gives it. So we should seek Him. We should be hungry and thirsty for Him. Matthew 4.4 4. But He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus is telling us we can't have life with physical food. That we, he said, that's not where you're, you're, you get life from. He says, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's the only way we're going to have life. Is through the word of God. Amen? Amen. Now we can understand why it says in Revelation 3.20, referring to the covenant meal. In Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is the Lord. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and we'll sup with him and he with me. Now have you ever thought of when you read this verse, have you ever thought sup and we'll sup with him? What's that mean? That's the covenant meal. You will have a meal with him. He said, I will have a meal with you. That's the covenant meal. So when you read Revelation Revelations three twenty and it comes to and I will sup with him, now you know what the Lord's saying. He says, Now I'm gonna have a covenant meal with you. That's what he's saying right here. A blood covenant to believers is, is we believe everything the Lord tells us. Everything. Do you understand that you cannot walk with God unless you believe everything in the Word, in the Bible? Amos 3.3 3 says, How can two walk together if they're not in agreement? So if there's things in the Bible that you disagree with, you can't walk with the Lord. It says it in Amos 3.3. 3. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth. The truth. Jesus says, I'm the truth. We believe the words of the Lord because we know that Jesus is truth. Because he says he's truth. So that's why we need to believe everything in the Bible. That is why we might not understand, we might not understand what he's telling us to do or not to do. Okay? We might not understand it. But we do it. Just like uh, the Jews at Passover. At, Pas at Passover, they told them, <clears throat> take the blood of the lamb and swipe it on one side of the door, slice it on the other, wipe it on the other side of the door, and, and wipe it on the top of the door. That's what the Jews were told to do. Now they did it. Did they understand what they were doing? No, but they did it. That represented the cross. That represented Jesus. And why can I say that? Because 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For even Christ, 
our Passover is sacrificed for us. He's our Passover. That's why you wipe the blood on the door because he's our, he's our sacrifice. He's our Passover. So that's why they put the blood on the door. So when the angel came, the death angel came, he passed over that door and the people that were in it. And the same thing is going to happen now. When it's time, the rapture, God's going to take those who are ready. Those of us who are ready. They didn't know why they were doing it. And they didn't know why they were told to be fully dressed. At this meal, they had the meal also. At this meal, God told them to be fully dressed. They didn't know that this was the last day they were going to be in Egypt. God was, the next morning, God was taking them out of Egypt. And that's why he told them, be dressed. I'm sure they got dressed again. They didn't know why they were doing that. They said, God said to put this blood here. I don't know why, but he said it. He said, to be fully dressed. Why we're going to get fully dressed, I don't know, but we're going to. So what I'm showing you is, we might not understand the words of God sometimes when he tells us to do something or not to do something. We might not understand it, but we do it. These Jews here, if they didn't put that blood on their door, what would have happened to them? The death angel wouldn't have crossed over it. It would have went in there. Yeah. Okay. If they didn't get dressed, made themselves ready for the next day to go to the promised land, what? They would have been left behind. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really pushing. Listen, we're not going to understand everything that God tells us to do or not to do, but we do it because we believe. And what's the most important of a covenant is we believe. We believe everything God tells us. That's why we should believe God's words, all of it. Remember, when you say you believe, it's believing all of God's words. I can't say that enough. Because people pick. Believe it or not, there's people who pick what they want to believe in the Bible. If they don't like what it says here, they don't accept it. Oh, I don't like that. So they don't accept it. Is that walking with the Lord? Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? Plainly says it. I don't have that verse down there, but you might want to write it down. Amos 3.3. 3. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? Jesus is the only one who gives us life. Jesus. I've been pointing that out. Jesus is the only one who gives us life. It doesn't say the way to the Father is a woman. It doesn't say that. Or, any, or anyone else. It doesn't say the way through the Father is here or them. It doesn't say that. If you're not praying in the name of Jesus... The Lord doesn't hear you. Jesus is the only way God can hear your prayers. Because 1 Timothy plainly says it clearly. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God, one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. There's no if, ands, or buts about that. If you want God to hear your prayers, you pray in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So this is a blood covenant between men. And I mixed in how it goes with us today also. And that's 